Good evening, everybody. This is Rob of Archangel Inc. And it is my pleasure to have a special guest with us tonight for Archangel Inc. Live number 50. Our guest tonight is Hassan Osman. Welcome, Hassan. Hey, Rob. Thanks for having me on. Yes, it is my pleasure. So folks out there, if you are just learning about Hassan, I will share a little bit about him. Hassan Osman is a director at Cisco Systems. Views are his own, where he leads global virtual teams on delivering large and complex programs. He also writes short books for busy managers. He is the author of several Amazon bestsellers, including Influencing Virtual Teams, Don't Reply All, and The Effective Delegation of Authority. Hassan hosts the Writer on the Side podcast, available at writeronthesside.com. And that podcast helps other full-time employees write and publish their nonfiction books. So uh, all of that said, it is a pleasure to have you as a, a guest tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm really excited about this. I know you and I have been interacting for quite a while and um, finally got to do this, which I'm super stoked about. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So one of the things, Hassan, as we were chatting uh, leading up to, to this conversation that I really respect and appreciate about you is the the way that you model this diversification of your author platform. Now you've got your full-time uh, profession and you're building this this writer writer on the side business, but um, but you're you're always keen to to learn about new opportunities, uh, new possibilities, things that people are doing, experiment with different things, and uh, bring a keen eye for that sort of research and and uh, sort of analytic approach to it and. That's kind of what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, we'll go over a couple of questions early on on kind of your background, how you got into this, but then just talk about some of these other uh, adjunct businesses, these other elements of building your authorship platform, because yeah. I think it's a, it's a great example for, for authors out there who say, hey, I've written a book, you know, kind of what else can I do? You know, there's only, uh, only so many Amazon ads that you can run. There are only so many times you can mention your book on your, um, you know, on your Facebook page or something. But there are a yeah. number of other opportunities and things that that people can do, uh, and I think you demonstrate a number of them really effectively. So uh, excited to to talk about this and share. Yeah, likewise. Let's jump right in. Excellent. Uh, fire away. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. So first, uh, first up, tell us about your background. Uh, why did you start writing? How did you determine what genre or genres uh, to uh, to write in? Yeah, so um, I'd like to keep this brief, but I'm going to give you like um, something I haven't talked to much about on previous shows uh, on how I got started. I was actually thinking about it because I know you and I connected and you're like, yeah, we'll kick it off with that. So mm -hmm. uh, at a high level, it was back in 2010 when blogging was still sort of, I mean, not, not it's in, in its heyday, but it's still sort of pretty popular. And I remember it was New Year's Eve 2010, 2011, and I was talking to a friend and he's like, what, um, you know, New Year's resolutions, what what are you thinking about? And I was like, you know what, I'm starting a blog. Just complete uh, knee jerk reaction to the question. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, well, you know that with uh, New Year's resolutions, um, no, no one usually follows through after like the second week or something. And I, you know, went to bed, woke up the next day and I said, if I don't have a blog launched by midnight tonight, January 1st, I'm never going to get this done. Signed up to WordPress.com. Back then, it was the, the thing, right? And I wrote my first blog post. Uh, started out my blog within like 60 seconds and uh, wrote maybe a few posts that, that month, launched it. And then I, I, don't rem I don't know if you remember WordPress.com. There was something called Freshly Pressed. It was sort mm -hmm. of like a collection. Like they select 10 uh, blog posts a day out of the hundreds of thousands of blogs. And I was very lucky. They they selected a couple of posts. They went viral, and um, I was hooked, man. Like I was like, all right. So, people want to read what I uh, what I publish out there, and just the high of getting it. And then ever since then, <laughs> continuing on with the blog, with writing, and then getting into the genre of uh, helping people. Right? It's really <laughs> about putting something that you uh, you have expertise in and uh, putting it out there in the world, and and someone picking it up and getting some value from it. So long-winded answer, but that's how it started. It started based on a New Year's Eve resolution. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. That's, that's a great story. Thank you so much for sharing. So yeah, I, I think one of the uh, one of the things, and, and we may, uh, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I love that emphasis that you have on uh, writing you know, uh, highly effective books, books that are going to be useful and just contributing to the lives of your readers, because that's something that we emphasize as well. When we're creating content, think about uh, think about what the other party, the person that you're asking to spend their time and energy on actually consuming your book, 
uh, is getting from it. And and there has to be some sort of value proposition there. And I think that you um, you do a really good job with that. You know, personally, I can vouch for several of the titles that you've produced. I've really enjoyed and, and found that you utilize that uh, that philosophy. Uh, and, and then also, obviously, on the writer on the side podcast and writing about the authorship business. Uh, that's that's a really big um, important component. So I love I love the share about your uh, just that high of, of reaching and positively impacting people early on and how it kind of fed into the next steps. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I do want to mention that I want to thank you for your uh, services. As you know, you've you've been a great supporter and I've reached out to uh, Archangel Inc. a few times to help me out with some of the audiobooks. And, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of say kudos to you and your team because you guys have been doing a fantastic job there. Um, yeah, I mean, going going back to your question about, uh, you know, the reason why you should write or any author should think about writing. Uh, to me, it's really about, you know, giving back. It's about teaching and it's really about solving a problem, particularly nonfiction, right? I have mm -hmm. no experience in the fiction field. Uh, with nonfiction, it really is about trying to solve a specific problem and trying to help your reader uh, go through that, preferably in a step-by-step -step fashion. Uh, one thing I keep gravitating towards is rule number one. And, and, and what that is, is to write a really, really useful book. And useful means three things. One, it means it should be helpful, right? Meaning your, your readers should take that book and uh, clearly articulate how has their life improved after reading it, right? Mm -hmm. So very simply, you know, again, solving problems is always a good thing. But in any other way, if you can help them improve, then you've accomplished at least one component of, out of being useful. Another is being short. Like I focus, my main genre is short books for busy managers because not a lot of managers have a lot of time these days. Everyone's super busy. I mean, you're bombarded with a thousand things online. You want to get to a solution as fast as possible and get, get out of, of reading and get that to, to that meet as, as fast as possible, right? So mm -hmm. that's my other thing. It's try to write a short book. A lot of people focus on like a 400 plus ma uh, page manual. No one reads those anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, um, you know, making it uh, or writing it well. And what I mean by mm -hmm. that is it doesn't have to be a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, book mm -hmm. or any sort of prose from that perspective, but really putting your um, effort, your, you know, your top effort into it because your readers are going to tell if you did it, you know, just a sloppy job to put something together really quickly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with those three things, if you really focus on that, that's really the core of why I write. And I think successful uh, authors uh, follow in terms of um, in terms of their books and and what they've published. Yeah, I love that. That makes me uh, think of the, I think it's a, a Mark Twain quote, or at least attributed to him. Uh, Part in the length of this letter, I didn't have time to make it short. Uh, and you know, it's yeah. funny, but <laughs> but it kind of highlights this idea of if you care about your readers, if you're if you're deliberate and intentional, you can really summarize, make it succinct, make it pointed, and think about delivering value. When you send something that's needlessly long, wordy, again, you know, it doesn't have to be Pulitzer Prize winning, yeah. but, uh, but something that um, is kind of direct and to the point, you're sending a signal, hey, I really respect and value your time, and I want you to get the most out of this book. Therefore, I'll put the work in on the back end, making it concise, making it effective, making it helpful, rather than expect you to kind of put the pieces together afterward because I couldn't be bothered to do it. Oh, absolutely. And and a lot of uh, people confuse the fact that it's short with it being easy to write. In fact, it's harder to, you know, to your point right. with that Mark Twain quote, it's a lot harder to actually think about how you can be concise and it's easier to just go on and on with useless fluff mm -hmm. just for padding sake. So yeah, it's it's you're doing your reader a favor by really being concise and getting to the main point of what you want to get to. Right. Love it. Absolutely. So uh, Hassan, uh, just going back to uh, this genre, I know you write short books for busy managers, uh, but you also write in uh, in the sort of travel genre as well. Uh, can you share just a little bit about how you decided to kind of approach both of those and, and decide that those would be genres that you would like to write in? Yeah. So I got started and maybe I didn't, you know, I kind of cut my story short really <laughs> quick there, but the... Um, the blog that I started was called The Couch Manager, and it was okay. about working remotely, um, given that I started with Cisco Systems. And again, to reinforce your point, views are my own. I don't represent Cisco in any way. I don't want the company lawyers to kind of knock on my door. <laughs> but um, the, um, you know, the fact that I was already managing teams that I don't see uh, basically 
you know, was the reason behind starting the blog. And the blog then turned into a course, a short course about managing virtual teams, which then turned into a book as well. So, you know, a collection of the most popular blog posts, as well as some new ones that I uh, kind of wrote just for exclusive for, for the book. And I, I published a book called Influencing Virtual Teams. That was sort of my uh, official, you know, first book on Amazon KDP and, um, and launched it. It was doing okay. But then, you know, more questions came in as a result of the book and, and the blog. And then I wrote books about, you know, don't, like Don't Reply All, which is about email communication and helping mm -hmm. other teams. And so that genre of short books for busy managers was uh, where I kind of found my sweet spot. It's something that I live day to day. It's something I'm interested in. And there's a market for it, obviously, right? I mean, a huge market there. But then after that, uh, I started getting a lot of questions about how do I write a book while working a full-time job? Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a book, which you can talk about in a second, called Write Your Book on the Sides, which is about full-time employees and how can they write books. And then as part of that process and talking to people who want to write about things uh, unrelated to um, you know, what, they're, what they're focused on, I came up with the idea of writing books uh, about travel. And the reason why is because I live in Boston. I'm based out of Boston, Massachusetts, but I'm originally uh, Lebanese. And then every year I go with my wife and two little girls um, to Beirut, Lebanon. And on the, because it's such a long trip, we usually break it in half and we spend maybe a couple of days in like Rome or Paris or London just as a, you know, um, transitory stop. So we're like, well, tickets are expensive and the kids are grown up to kind of, you know, at they're, they're at the age where they'd like to explore a new city. Why don't we kind of spend a couple of days um, you know, in one of those cities on the way there. And so the first year we wanted to do Rome and it was uh, overwhelming to do so much in so little mm -hmm. time. And so I, given that I'm a project manager, I project managed everything down to like the 15 minute mark. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who's listening is they've got kids, but they know that, you know, like half an hour in, it's like, oh my God, I just can't handle the nagging going back to the hotel. So put together a plan and then I'm like, well, I know how to publish books. Why don't I just put this together, this whole plan that I published in a short book. And I started the series. The first one was called Rome in a Weekend with two kids, <laughs> Paris in a Weekend with two kids, and then London in a Weekend with two kids. So it's sort of a series, but it's really a side hobby. I don't, you know, my uh, long-term goal, Rob, is not to be a travel blogger or, a, you know, Rick Steves. <laughs> so it's just it's just something that's fun. And plus, I could document and talk about it, uh, about the process and kind of learn from that process as well. So that's sort of the second genre. Got it. Excellent. Well, yeah, I appreciate all, all of that. And one of the things that strikes me about both that and sort of the, the couch manager side of it, uh, as well as sort of adjunct to that, the, the, the writer on the side element is it. it seems like all of these are coming from uh, from experience and, and then also a market need just recognizing yeah. hey there there is something that that I struggled with you know how do I plan a, a family trip with with two young children uh, going to an international location okay great I spent you know however many hours days weeks months getting ready for this all of that information is useful there's there's perhaps a pathway to uh, to shorten the learning curve for somebody else who's looking to do something similarly and and therefore let's put this together uh, when when I created one of my I, I think actually my first uh, my first book it's the how to create an, uh, an audiobook for audible uh, it's it's really just a short guide uh, that I initially created as a um, as a training module for for uh, an audiobook editor that I was bringing on board it had lots of screenshots uh, information yep. kind of step by step on you know here's the program here's where we find it here's a link to, to find it and here's what it looks like and uh, and so forth and then kind of show, documenting what happens and and I think in many cases the the books with um, with greatest long-term value come out of those actual needs. And so I, yeah, I appreciate, um, you know, that, that approach. And again, it's yeah. kind of just doubling down on what you mentioned when you are, when you're keeping your, your audience uh, in mind, you're creating something really, really useful, then um, you can, you can actually make a positive impact on others. Oh, absolutely. And you know, one, one way, cause a lot of people, and I'm sure you get this question a lot, Rob, as well, given that you're in the publishing space is, you know, what do I write about? Right. And you know, that's a big question. That's, that's usually popular. And I think about it as like a Venn diagram with three intersecting circles. Mm -hmm. The first is interest. The second is experience. And then the third is market. And, you know, really quickly, interest is something you're interested in. Uh, you know, you don't have to be absolutely madly in love in the topic, but something that really, you know, at least it's your cup of tea, right? It's something that you're interested in. Uh, and then from an experience standpoint, 
Again, you don't have to have a PhD in the field. You have to know a little bit more than the average Joe or Jane out there in terms of your experience and how you went through the specific topic. And then most importantly, it's a market, right? You have to do the research on whether the topic that you're writing about is a an actual need out there that people are either asking you about on forums, emails, um, you know, it's just parts of the questions that come up as, as you know, friend conversations, for example. Mm -hmm. And the intersection of those three is really important, right? When you have the intersection of all those three is where you, you know, it's a good idea to write a book about in that topic. And just going back uh, to what you were saying, whether it's the short books for busy managers or like the short travel guides for busy parents, um, those bo both those genres meet those three circles uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the, the the focus of what I write about. And so that's why I, I kind of do it. I love it. Yeah, thank you for sure. I, I, that that idea of meeting on that Venn diagram uh, makes a whole lot of sense. It's a great model and template for how to think about things and how to approach it as as an author conceptualizing your next project. Yeah, and you know, there's one other thing that I, especially for writers on the sides, um, you know, whether you're an entrepreneur such as yourself or uh, a full-time employee, there's one more element which is optional, not ma mandatory, but to be job-related or business-related mm -hmm. to the field mm -hmm. you're in. This gives you a huge boost, and I'll give you an example. So with my short books for busy managers, that checks the box on a job-related uh, category, right? Whether it's influencing virtual teams or effective delegation or better online meetings, all the topics that I write about in this genre are related to my job and the work that I do is part of my career. Mm -hmm. What this does is it helps sort of uh, 10x your, your brand value out there in the marketplace. It basically, you get invited to keynote speeches, conferences, you're looked at as a thought leader. And so it opens up opportunities, whether within your current organization or even beyond it, um, or even more business if you're an entrepreneur, right? It sort of uh, works as a business card on steroids. Um, whereas if it's non-job related, like my travel books, right? I'm no uh, expert on travel or a travel blogger. Yes, you can still publish successful books in that area, but it's not gonna add much value in terms of it being job related or business related to, to what you currently do day to day, right? So there is that uh, element that I think is important to factor in if you're thinking about a topic that you want to uh, write about. Yeah, I love it. That, that That's something that we emphasize a lot when, uh, particularly a lot of the clients that we work with are, are professionals, people who are using their book as a way to build their platform, as a way to uh, enhance their prestige in their field, to become literally the author uh, of that uh, of that subject, the author on that that topic. And we really, uh, something else that you've, uh, you've mentioned, which I really love, you know, in many cases you can make more, um, whoop, I, I'm trying to make sure I say it right. Um, make sure, make more from your book than the, from the sales of your book. Yes. Right? So, so yeah, more money because of your book than from your book. Right. And what yes. I meant, so that what I meant by that is that the royalties that you get from my, from your book are probably going to be minuscule compared to the uplift, uh, or, you know, or the upsides of having that business card on steroids, right? Again, mm -hmm. potentially consulting gigs, potential speaking and that sort of thing, or even um, courses or what have you that that have a higher price point than just the, the royalties. But having said that, um, I don't mind sharing some numbers with you here mm -hmm. uh, for your audience. So I'll give you an example. Influencing virtual teams doesn't sell that much, um, you know, between one to five copies a day. Uh, I wrote it back in 2014. So you do the math. I had the book at like maybe $2.99. You know, my cut is like 70% of that after Amazon's um, Amazon's cut, which is which translates to around a couple of dollars per book of profit, right? Mm -hmm. If you do the math, that's like a couple of hundred dollars a month, right? I mean, that's it's better than zero, right? You never want to, you know, say no to any <laughs> sort of positive numbers, but it's not something you can retire on anytime soon. Mm -hmm. But then because the book was about influencing virtual teams and COVID hit, everyone started working remotely. Everyone started wanting to know a little bit more about how do you manage people you don't see. And so just organically through Amazon's algorithm, because people were searching for remote work and virtual teams and so on and so forth. And thankfully, you know, my book was highly uh, rated on Amazon, had a, had a bunch of reviews on it. It exploded and it exploded by like at least 10 X. So a couple of months, it was like maybe $2,200 uh, a month just from that. Now, that's not sustainable. It, again, it's not something you can retire on. But the idea is that, yes, the royalties, you don't want to sort of put all your eggs in one basket that this is what you're going to live off. But 
it's money that could come in down the line due to an event months or years from now. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Oprah picks up your book and says, oh, look at that, right? So the infrastructure is there and, and you can sort of uh, get the value from it. So it's a long-term asset, let's put it that way. Yep, I love that that idea of just the the readiness that you have when the book is out there and on the market for for some sort of turn of event that can uh, can elevate your your prestige, your standing, and so forth, um, and without you having to do any additional work, right? Because it's it's up there and it's automated and it's on Amazon and it's got its reviews and, and all right. of that. So um, yeah, it's not as if you you suddenly have ten times more clients, so you've got ten times the workload and and maybe no exactly. no more addition of of hours in the day. But uh, yeah, it works um, works really well. So I love you, love the story. Thank you for sharing some of those sure. uh, numbers in particular. Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's keep it moving here. And um, we've talked a little bit about background and, and genres. And I um, uh, next thing up, are there any key lessons learned um, from publishing in different genres? You know, particular differences in um, uh, in advertising or uh, building out your platform, for example, or audience expectations. Um, yeah, speaking about different genres, uh, and then also yeah. potentially if you like different uh, platforms, because I know uh, we'll get to that a little bit as well. Yeah, so, you know, because I publish primarily on Amazon, and because most of my books are, well, no, all of them are about nonfiction, mm -hmm. the differences in like advertising platforms doesn't, you know, isn't, isn't, there is no major discrepancy between all of them. Mm -hmm. But there is a double edged part of what the, the story that I mentioned, I just gave you the positive side. Mm -hmm. uh, the negative side, the flip side of it is that with my travel books, not a single person bought a copy during COVID mm -hmm. because no one wanted to travel. And I'm not even, you know, I'm not even saying it was sort of a dip in sales. It's literally zero. Like no wow. one wants to go wow. for a weekend to Rome with two kids and <laughs> all of this. <laughs> so the, the takeaway is that you do want to think about diversification of your portfolio with books. So if you plan on writing multiple books, I think this was an eye, eye opener for me where you kind of don't want to think about just one specific category or genre, but really think about diversifying just like you would with any financial portfolio, right? You don't want to put all your savings in one stock. You never know what might happen. And so just having that is going to be really uh, helpful for you. And, 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 you know, the expectations there might be set. Now, another thing is, yeah, you have to treat each audience separately. Like every audience has their own specific needs. So for example, with every book, I have a freebie that they, you know, people can download and they can sign up using their email address so that they can find out about my other books. Uh, all the freebies for the short books for busy managers are complementary to corporate managers and large organizations. You know, whether it's a PowerPoint deck or a cheat sheet for them to learn uh, or get the condensed version of the book. With the travel books, it's more about a map, for example, that can help them. Um, I'm getting a little bit of interesting flickering there. I don't know if you can see it, but um, <laughs> but anyway, fingers crossed it'll it'll sort itself out. Up. So okay, cool. okay on my end. <laughs> cool, good, good, good. Um, so I just want to make sure my my voice is coming in uh, coming across clearly on the on the live uh, live stream. But anyway, the what, what I was trying to say is that with the um, travel books people want sort of a map, a Google map, for example, of, of the pathway that they can take with their own kids, right? So you really have to think about your audience. You really think have to think about um, what their needs are, what their pain points are, and then with any follow-ups with them, they are a different demographic. So from that perspective, I think they're different, but in terms of actual um, marketing or you know anything I tested, it's pretty much similar on the Amazon platform. Awesome. Yeah. Great, great feedback and uh, appreciate that. That's such a, just an interesting uh, tale, you know, about that diversification. And if you have something available in multiple genres, you know, you can, in some cases be, uh, be primed to, to really uh, level up and in some cases, unfortunately be primed to, uh, to flatten out. But, um, but yeah, great, uh, great lesson there. And just, if you have multiple, multiple avenues, then um, you have a little bit more resilience. Yep. Yep. Definitely. I mean, that's that's a great strategy to follow. And again, post COVID, I uh, learned a huge lesson there. Right. <laughs> Maybe I should start with like children books now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, we did we did a video uh, some some months ago in the midst of uh, you know when things started to, to kind of uh, lock down about the the status of the industry and and children's books were one of the the genres that were uh, seeing an uptick for uh, for many authors. Yep. Yep. Definitely, because everyone's at home and. 
You want to read yeah. books, right? Yeah, you've got you've got eight hours of time to spend with uh, the little <laughs> ones, so you want to you want to find some way to, to help pass that time. Right. <laughs> All right. So uh, moving on, another question that I have: uh, Why did you start the Writer on the Side podcast? You addressed it maybe a little bit in passing, uh, and then a, a couple of follow-ups to that. You know, have there been any pain points um, that you've had to overcome? You know, starting kind of on a, a different medium, uh, and then do you have any practical tips on beginning a podcast for authors? you know, who are looking to get into this, whether that's equipment or technical recommendations, uh, selecting topics, uh, preparing for interviews, uh, locating and, and soliciting guests, uh, you know, any of that, uh, any any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot to talk about there. So let me, um, let me start out by saying, you know, I, I mentioned the Write Your Book on the Side book that I published. Uh, and by the way, that book is 100% free. You can go grab it on Amazon. Uh, and I do have a copy of it here. And one thing I remember that was just flipping through it is if I go to the back, I see a familiar name down there. I don't know if you can see it. Hey, there you go, Mr. Mr. Rob Archangel there, That's right. That's uh, right. kindly uh, endorsing the book. And by the way, with this book, the um, audio book was again through your services. Uh, I think Greg, um, Greg was the narrator Sorry. for it. Yep, <laughs> yeah, great, great, pleasure. great uh, narrator. So thank you for doing that. So when I wrote the book, I started getting a lot of questions about, okay, great, like you know, you gave you gave us the the sort of big picture. How do we do that? And then you started getting some specific questions about. Um, things that the book now became a little bit outdated on. I tried to keep it up to date, but it's very hard to do that on a week by week basis, right? Maybe you do it once a year. So I was like, well, you know, I'm still getting those questions. Um, a podcast is a great way to kind of have, continue on those conversations do and do a couple of things with them. One is continue to teach, which I absolutely love, continue to give back and, and share my sort of experience as well as uh, documenting and not creating. So that's a whole Gary V. Uh, philosophy for those of you who are who, who follow him and meaning you know I'm writing those books I'm learning as I'm going um, maybe share that l those lessons learned with other authors so that they can learn from my mistakes and not from theirs and then the other thing Rob which I think is fantastic and I've had you on the show uh, to talk about audiobook production as well um, it's a great way to meet and network with people I mean it's just a fantastic way you know if I gave you a call I didn't know you very well and I was like you know Rob how about we spend like 20 minutes I want to pick your brain about a couple of things you're gonna be like I don't have time for that but if I say I'm gonna have you on the podcast I'm gonna you know market your book or your platform or your business and we're gonna get to you know discuss meet each other and have an interesting conversation the chances of that, you know, someone saying yes to that are nearly 100%. They're not 100%, but nearly 100%. So it's a great way to meet people. I'm a people person, very extroverted. I just absolutely love the dynamism and, and just, uh, you know, connecting with interesting and like-minded people. So that was another reason. It was sort of self-serving too. It's like, well, you get to meet uh, fantastic people across the world. And so the combination of both of those w was that, okay, documenting what I'm creating and meeting interesting people and networking with them and, and helping them sort of be successful um, is something that's keeping me going. It's it's ad free, by the way, the writer on the side podcast, I still don't accept any, I mean, that might change, you never know, someone might lose their job <laughs> at one point. But, um, you know, I do it because I absolutely love it. And it's just it's just fun for me. <laughs> overall. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I I, uh, I also can can vouch for it. I've listened to I I think you're up to episode fifty ish, mid fifties or sixties. Fifty two. Yeah, we just published 50, the fifty second one this yeah. week. Yeah, and uh, and it's really great content. Uh, any author out there who's interested, we've mentioned it on the on the stream before on some of our resources. Certainly recommend checking it out. Uh, Hassan has been a number of interesting guests. Um, you know, my present company. Uh, you know, <laughs> humbly uh, excluded, but um, or included. Excuse me, but uh, but a number of really great. Uh, bits of information, a uh, number of uh, guests, and then another a number of podcasts that you've done on your own. Um, so yeah, I, I that's that's a really helpful. That's a good answer too, because as you mentioned, when you're publishing, you know, maybe you you publish a revised edition on a, on a annual basis, maybe twice annual basis, something like that. But uh, but being able to have an ongoing podcast or, or platform, you know, website, yeah. et cetera, you know, allows you to really kind of stay on the cutting edge and, and demonstrate your relevance and demonstrate your, your ongoing authority and expertise in your, in your arena. So um, really great idea. Uh, in, in terms of uh, recommendations, you know, somebody who's interested in starting out and they say, okay, how do I, how do I get started? What sort of equipment um, can I use? 
you know, is there any technical barrier that I should be aware of? You know, any challenges that you've had as, as you've started up that um, that you found some effective workarounds for? Yeah, I mean, there's so much to talk about there, Rob. So I'll try to kind of keep it brief. But there's just two ways to kind of think about this. The first is the technical aspect. So if you think about it, and if you can see this, that's my microphone. I use an a professional. Well, I don't. I don't want to call it like a really, really professional microphone. It's an AT or an Audio Technica 2020. Uh, USB mic. So the, the first sort of um, thing you want to be, be sure of is to get some good audio equipment, right? The worst thing you want to have is like some scratchy or really low quality uh, sounds coming through your podcast. Uh, and then the other thing is that you also want to make sure you get to understand how to use some um, uh, editing software, audio editing software. I, I have a PC, so I use uh, Audacity. Um, which is free, by the way. You can just kind of learn it uh, on YouTube. And then I also use Auphonic, which is taking the uh, different... So, if, for example, when I had you on the podcast, I would record a pre-roll later on, not when we're sort of having the live conversation. But then what happens is there is a um, difference in vocal variation between when I recorded my pre-roll solo, right, which is like the intro part, and then when we were talking over, let's say, Skype or any other tool, you, you'd find that the volume level is different. What Ophonic does uh, is it takes all of that, including the music, the intro music and the outro music, and it kind of consolidates them into sort of a single decibel level uh, uh, volume loudness, right, for people to kind of maintain that. So that's one thing I learned, you know, from a technical aspect. Uh, a lot more to learn. You know, I use Libsyn, for example, L-I-B-S-Y-N, which is a uh, way to upload your podcast and then have it syndicated to Apple um, uh, iTunes. There, it's not uh, iTunes anymore. It's Apple Podcasts. And then, of course, uh, with Google and Stitcher and Spotify and all those uh, other mm -hmm. platforms. So you kind of upload it once and it goes uh, all the way. Um, so that, that's on the technical side. I'm happy to answer any other questions. But then there's also the soft skills side, right? Which is a huge learning curve for me. I've never, I don't have a journalism background. I don't have any experience interviewing people, but I learned by doing. And I honestly, like I just started watching a few videos. Uh, big shout out to Pat Flynn. I took his course, uh, Power Up Podcasting. So that really helped. Uh, I kind of shortcut a lot of, um, uh, a lot of lessons learned for me and, and again, mistakes that he's done. He's uh, such a successful podcaster. But, um, you know, in terms of learning it, trying to kind of be um, very well prepared, just like you did with me, right? Preparing questions ahead of time. Here's what we're going to be talking about. Here's the limit of the times that we want to talk about. And then doing your research about that person, right? You don't want to go in and ask, you know, maybe basic questions that anyone can easily Google. It's like, well, I already know that about you. Here's my follow-up question, right? Mm -hmm. So I think those make for a much more interesting uh, conversation and uh, kind of digging deep into what you want to get in terms of value uh, for your listeners. Love it. Yeah, it's great, great overview, great uh, way of approaching it, and uh, perfect. That's uh, I think exactly what I was uh, what I was hoping to um, to cover. Uh, moving moving on because I know uh, we do have a uh, speaking of, of limits. I want to make sure I respect your time. Yeah, uh, sure. We've got a couple of other things that that we had on board here. Um, you recently published a detailed article on Gumroad uh, versus Amazon for self publishing, and I'll include a link uh, down below. Uh, most of our audience, I would say, is familiar with KDP. Uh, so, can you share some of the key benefits of Gumroad for for those who may not have been exposed to it before, um, and you know, see who who Gumroad might be a good option for? Yeah, so uh, thanks for mentioning the post. In fact, uh, it took me several hours to put it together. It's like nearly 4,000 words long. Uh, it got some traction on Twitter. The The topic is Gumroad versus Amazon KDP and which one is, uh, is better for you as an author. So I go through, I think, maybe like 12 different categories and I analyze each one and I give you who the winner is based on my experience and some conversations I've had uh, with folks who've published on both. Um, not a lot of people know uh, Gumroad, right? A lot of people do know Amazon. It's the biggest bookseller out there. Uh, but there are some pros to Gumroad because I did experiment with it um, for my last book. And um, I'll give you the, the high level summary, okay? Sure. Yes. Um, if you want to maximize profits, right? If you really care about the money and you already have a fairly large audience, and you have a lot of time and energy to direct traffic off your book to Gumroad, 
uh, then Gumroad is the best option for you, right? So if you're really thinking about, again, you have a platform, you have an audience, you're really thinking about maximizing the amount of money and you have enough uh, clout out there and energy and time to direct traffic to your book, then Gumroad is way better than Amazon. However, mm -hmm. if you care more about brand value, right? So you really care about getting your brand name out there. Maybe you have a smaller audience or a, or a non-existent audience. And you're going, you want to rely more on organic traffic and reach as opposed to you manually directing traffic, uh, then Amazon KDP is hands down the option for you, right? So there's pros and cons with both, but those, this is sort of the high level summary uh, of where I think you should go. Now, having said that, you can absolutely do both. And there are a lot of authors. In fact, the last uh, couple of uh, guests I've had on the show, the, the latest episode with uh, Zeno Rocha. He's just published a book, uh, made around $18,000 in uh, six weeks. And we kind of talked about that on the show. And he has published on both Gumroad and Amazon KDP. And an interesting thing is, even though it makes more money to kind of put it, or, or in terms of your uh, profit potential, the royalties, uh, you make a lot more on, on Gumroad than you do on Amazon because they take a smaller cut, meaning Gumroad takes a smaller cut of the book price point. Um, both uh, Zeno, who I interviewed recently, and another uh, gentleman by the name of Avid Kahl, um, who is also published in both Gumroad and Amazon. When I asked them both a, both a question about if I were if I was a customer and I say I want to buy your book and I had to choose one platform, where would you direct me to, Gumroad or Amazon? And keep in mind, Gumroad makes more money. If the book is nine ninety nine ninety nine on both platforms, you're going to make a bigger cut on Gumroad. And mm -hmm. both of them said. Amazon, because they mm. care more about the organic traffic, the reach, the brand value, and then getting that sort sort of social proof from there. So, huge takeaway: you know, you can never discount Amazon, even if the the numbers are are lower and they take a bigger cut off of your price point. So, yeah, that, that's wonderful. Thank you for for the detailed uh, but still high level summary there. You know, one one of the sentiments that I've had in the last several years, I would say, is that I think that as authors start to grow their brand. And grow their platform, there is going to be more of a shift. And I've already seen it on on at least a handful of the folks that we've worked with as, as well as others that we've been in contact with uh, toward selling on your own site, building your own platform. I think Gumroad is a really good uh, option and kind of halfway point uh, between Amazon and you know selling exclusively on your own site because they do have a marketplace. Uh, there is an expectation there. There's a little bit of uh, prestige that comes along with Gumroad as opposed to you know Joe Smith's uh, own personal website. Yeah, yeah. But um, but as you mentioned, the, the royalty potential is higher and the uh, the price anchoring is a little bit different there. It's quite of common course. to see, see books that are sold for you know $29.99, $37, $99 and, and on up versus on Amazon. When the the way that they price their royalty structure, they really try to encourage authors to price between $299 and seven dollars or excuse me, and $9.99. You know, yeah. Beyond that, um, the the structure becomes a lot less favorable to the author, and and so you know they're trying to anchor that price really in that in that range. So um, Gumroad, I think, is a is a great alternative, and I really appreciate that you've been experimenting with it, having people on to talk about it, and and as you mentioned, for authors that do have their own uh, their own followership, and you know have a little bit more recognition and, um, you know, a little bit more uh, kind of oomph behind uh, any sales push that they might have. Um, a platform like Gumroad, a Gumroad, excuse me, I think can be uh, can be a really good good option. So, oh yeah, absolutely. And and you make a great point about the price anchoring because with Gumroad you can really go high on that number, right? With Amazon, if I see a business book for like thirty seven dollars for the ebook version, you're you're probably not going to get a lot of traction on that. Versus with Gumroad, thirty seven dollars and it's just a PDF document, people would buy that, right? And you get a very, and that's why I started off. By if you care about maximizing profits, another thing really quick, and I know we're, we're you know, uh, want to kind of wrap up just based on your questions, but really important is that with Gumroad, you can package upsells as well. So I can say uh, I'm selling my book for $37, but if you want the audio version of it or you want, you know, a half hour consulting or you want some, you know, sort of small freebie or a downloadable, um, you know, version of whatever, then you can upsell from $37 to maybe $125, right? So there's there's that option with, with Gumroad that you don't have with Amazon. And so that flexibility 
And then another really quick advantage with Gumroad, they give you access to all the email addresses. So you can communicate with your readers with Amazon that's protected, right? That you cannot, you, you don't automatically sign up unless you basically provide some sort of uh, freebie for that. So. Yeah, I love it. Great, great uh, insight. And that is something that we've, uh, we really harp on. There is value in having that, that email contact list and building your, um, your network of people who are interested in, in the work that you're doing. So um, love it. Uh, again, uh, I know we're, we're um, trying to keep things tight here. So let's uh, go on to the, the final question that I wanted to chat about briefly, uh, which is um, uh, marketing. You know, that's that's one of the biggest challenges I would say for, for authors. You know, are there any tips or practices that you found effective? And then in general, what sort of questions should authors be asking of themselves and of their market to uh, help share their message effectively? Yeah, great question. And um, look, I think it starts with a foundation. Uh, I think before you start thinking about where you want to spend your money on marketing or advertising, I think it starts with a with rule number one, which is writing a really, really useful book. If you really believe that your book is a good book, then you check the first box, right? Before we start thinking about marketing, because you don't. The only thing you'll do when it, when it you know, if you have a horrible book and you try to market it, all you're doing is accelerating the fact that people are going to get really disappointed in you and your product, right? Mm -hmm. So starting out with that. The second layer above that is to also make sure that the infrastructure for selling your book is pristine. And what I mean by that is you have to have a professionally designed cover, for example. You have to have a solid um, book title and subtitle. Your sales page or the book description, which acts as a sales page, uh, needs to be convincing enough or it highlights the pain points of your readers so that they're convinced to buy. You should have enough social proof, meaning Amazon reviews, so that people know that this is legitimate and they get to hear and, and, and read what is what other people think about. So that is another thing, right? So if you know before you start that with spending money on marketing, I would say make sure it's a good book, make sure the infrastructure, and we can talk for ages on that, uh, is, and I'm sure you, you're an expert in this stuff as well, uh, is you know getting the basics right. Now, after you've taken care of that, to me, marketing is two things. It's who is your customer and where do they hang out? Mm -hmm. And those sound easy, but they really you really need to crystallize them. So understand who the um, you know the avatar of your customer is and where do they spend most of your their time. Once you figure that out, then it becomes easier where you can go out there and start publishing content on it. To me, with short books for busy managers, that genre that I write in, the biggest traction I get is LinkedIn these days. Like if I just publish posts, again, I'm not selling anything. It's just selling uh, on, on you know, or writing content that helps people uh, think and what have you, and then using your profile to sell, right? People see that you're an author of the following books and they go check it out and they buy it. But I couldn't tell you the direct correlation between people reading it and, and uh, reading posts and then going out there. Another thing that's, um, I'm not a big fan personally of uh, spending money on uh, Facebook advertising. That's just my preference. I just feel like people are on Facebook not to buy, but I am a fan of spending money on Amazon ads because that to me is the least intrusive, right? People are on there to buy. If they see something that's sponsored, it doesn't come off as slimy or sleazy and mm -hmm. people just naturally sort of click through. So that's a good uh, good thing to kind of, you know, learn a little bit about and, and spend some, some potential funds on as well. And then of course the basic, um, you know, write your, keep pumping content ads, whether it's blog, Twitter, any other social media really helps. Love it. Yeah. Great, great summary of a number of different things to think about and approaches to take. So I, I, um, I, I really appreciate you joining us uh, here tonight. Hassan, this is a, a pleasure to have you on. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Are there ways for people to connect with you going forward if they'd like to learn more about any of your content and just being in touch? Yeah, thanks for asking. So uh, you can find me on writerontheside.com. Uh, all my contact information is there. Again, you can download this book 100% for free on Gumroad or on Amazon. Um, and you can sign up for the podcast if you want to. All the links are there. So you can just sort of click around and find anything you're interested in. And uh, feel free to uh, reach out and say hello. I'd be interested in yeah. connecting. 
Absolutely. Well, yeah, thank you again, Hassan. And for anybody out there who's watching, please do definitely uh, reach out and, and check out Hassan's work. Really high quality material. And again, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to have Hassan on tonight. And if you're interested in doing uh, any of these topics and becoming a writer on the side and, and learning and building your authorship brand, uh, Hassan is, is a fantastic resource. So uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you next week on Archangel Inc. Live for the next installment. Have a great evening. Take care. Thank you.